We're going to get into God's Word today, and I, I just hope that you came in uh, just desiring for God's Word to change you and challenge you today. Um, I firmly believe that God wants to do something in our midst through His Word today where our Christmas season is completely different, where we're changed and transformed by the power of His Word. Because how many of us believe that God's Word has authority and power to change us? And so we're going to dive in, and we're going to look at some key elements of living reconciled. And here's what I want you to hear first and foremost. You can live reconciled independent or not dependent upon the other person. You say, how does that work? Watch, we're going to show you today. We're going to show you what it means to live a reconciled life. And I believe that how we can love first and how we can move uh, our mission and vision forward is critical during these holiday seasons. And I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would just show up and just move upon your hearts today to transform you, to mold, move on you and mold you and shape you into what he has for you today. I believe that God's going to do something in some relationships and some families today like he's never done before. They, there's going to be a, a, a place where people walk in this Christmas holiday and they're going to say, there's something different in this home. Because I believe that God's peace can come to each of our homes. And you know my history. You know my story. You know that I, I sometimes wasn't raised in a home of peace. And, and so that's why I'm very passionate about it. Because I believe that our homes can be the safest place ever for people to experience the peace of God. And so we're going we're gonna to dive into God's word in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today. And look at some elements of God's peace. Some things about reconciliation and that will challenge us and hopefully change us as we go through. Let's pray, okay? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray that it won't be my words that change and transform anyone, but it will be simply your word embedded deep into our hearts that would change and transform us, God. Lord, we live in a culture where peace is seldom, where nitpicking and pulling down and putting others uh, second and putting ourselves first. We live in a culture that is in a place of chaos, God. And yet, Lord, we know that the church is a place of peace, that the church, and I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the people, our people are vessels of your peace, the gospel of peace. And so, Lord, I pray that you would change us, that you would challenge us, that you would transform us more into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. God, go before us today. Lord, we lay aside every distraction and hindrance that would keep us from hearing the word of God. And we listen to you today in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you better hold on. He's got a lot of information to give out today. And that you are going to be changed. Tell him you're going to be changed today. Go ahead. Yeah, a few of you. I heard you, when he asked you to applaud for Thanksgiving, like two people applauded. So we're going to get you warmed up. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. And I'm going to be talking about your perspective today and how you view relationships today and, and how you view each other today. And look at this in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Can you say amen? Think about this for a moment. Now, I wish I had the time to go all through the context of chapter 5 because he's talking about an eternal perspective versus a temporal perspective if you come down through there. And he kind of begins to sum up this chapter and he says, for the love of Jesus Christ controls us. Think about that in your home in this Christmas season, that the love of Jesus Christ comes into your home and begins to control you. You say, well, how does that happen? Jesus is patient. Patience is going to control you this Christmas season. You say, oh, you haven't been in my kitchen. Kindness is going to flow over your homes this Christmas season. You say, how do I know? Because I know Jesus Christ inside of you. You are controlled by the love of Jesus Christ. And so you say, you don't know my spouse. I don't need to know your spouse because I know you're Jesus. And if Jesus is inside of you, he's going to change you. He's going to transform you. He's going to shape you. He's going to mold you. I'm a little bit fired up about this sermon today. What am I saying to us? I think it's time that we step back and say, I'm not controlled by my ancestry.com. I'm, I'm controlled by Jesus. I'm controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit. We all have a history, church. And I don't really care about your history. I care about your Jesus today. 
And what am I saying to you in this moment? I says, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and for your fallenness and for your ancestry.com. He died for it. You can no longer make a, a joke or an excuse for yourself, say, well, I'm just, this is my temperament. This is just who I am because I'm a German or I'm a Swedish or I'm a Finnish or I'm a, I'm Finnish too. 27%, that's what Ancestry.com said. And what am I saying to you? I'm saying that I don't care about your heritage. I don't care about all those things. You are no longer controlled by fear in your homes any longer. You are no longer controlled by bitterness or anger any longer. Today is a new day. Jesus Christ is risen, and you are now controlled by his love. What if our homes were free from fear or bitterness? You know, some of you say, we get, we get along really well. Let me tell you something. If I put a tape recorder, if you don't know what that is, it's a little thing like this that spins. If I put a tape recorder in your kitchen where the real conversations happen, would it be a place where it's uplifting, where it's building others up? Because if it was like my family reunions, oh, in the living room, everyone's happy. In the kitchen, everyone's mad. And I'm here to tell you that when you're talking about Aunt Betsy so-and-so and so-and-so and this and that in your kitchen, God wants you to say, shut up and be controlled by my love today. Because we are not to be people who are controlled by people's past or their fallenness, but we are to be controlled by God's patience and kindness and hope. And that we don't, aren't controlled by the past or the resentment, but we as peacemakers are controlled by the love of Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're all dead. That's what it says. Having concluded this, that Jesus died for all, therefore all are dead. Look at the person next to you and say, you're looking quite dead today. <laughs> now say thank you to them. You say, how is that a compliment? Because if you haven't died with Jesus yet, then you got some problems. Hell is a real place. And only those who have died to themselves, and laid their lives at the cross, can be walk in the newness that Christ provides. you got to be dead in order to be resurrected. Death starts the ability to be resurrected. And I'm here to tell you that you are some walking dead things. I'm here to tell you that no matter what you're going through, that if you will learn to die to yourself and walk in that newness of life, it will change and transform you. My hope is at the end of this sermon, some of you will look at each other and you will fall in love with each other again and your grandchildren are going to see that. I'm hoping that when they walk in, you're holding hands and they're like, oh my goodness, grandma and grandpa's gone nuts. <laughs> Why? Because you're not controlled by what she did or she didn't do. You are now controlled by the love of Christ and you're dying to yourself. Look at that verse 15. And Jesus died for all so that they who live might no longer live for, the, for themselves. Get a hold of that. This is the why that Jesus died. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves. Do you know how uh, counterculture that statement is right there? Our whole culture says live for yourself. Our whole culture says do it for yourself. And this is where I want you to hear very loud and clear that we are not to be cultural people where we're controlled by the temperament of our country. We are to be Christ-controlled people who are controlled by the love of Jesus Christ. And we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for what's comfortable for us. Could you imagine if Jesus lived for himself? He would have been in that garden. He'd say, God, take this cup from me. He say, well, I'm living for myself, so I'm sure that was the Father's voice and he would have just walked away. I am so glad that we serve a Savior who did not live for himself, but he lived for the rest of humanity, that he would die for them, that he would be buried for them and resurrect and appear for them. And that if we will place our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, it says if we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. This last Thanksgiving, we had a, a great Thanksgiving service. And right back over here in this corner, 
for whatever reason, do you ever get excited about Jesus just a little bit? And I walked up, and I think it was Ivan and Teresa, if I, yeah, I think they were talking to some gentleman back here. And I don't know what came over me. I just said, have you repented of your sins? I said to this guy. And he looked at me. He says, I did when I was a kid. And I said, yeah, repentance is a daily thing. Let's get right before Jesus tonight. And let me tell you something. I don't think that we need to repent every day to save us. But we do need to repent to continue that right relationship with God. Because we want to die to ourselves. Not for salvation, but for sanctification. That he will challenge us and change us. Because we no longer live for ourselves. But how many of you know that if you walk with Jesus for a little bit, it can be very easy to remember that time. That time when Jesus moved in our hearts. That time when the Holy Spirit really moved. That time. And let me tell you, I'm tired about thinking about that time. I want this time to be that time. I want right now to be that time. And it comes through a humble heart with Jesus of saying, God, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to begin to... To proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and I'm going to live a repentive life. Why? Because we're not living for ourselves any longer. We're living for the one who's directing our lives. Look at the rest of this verse. But for him who died and rose again on our behalf. That's what we're living for. For the one who died and rose again on our behalf. I mean... I don't know about you, but I love turkey, but I can guarantee this. God is a much better chef than I will ever be. The day I'm looking forward to sitting at his banquet. Some of you are going to complain about it because of what's served, but I can't get over that. I just have to look at God's face. It's going to be a great banquet, and we will have all of everything done exactly right, whatever right is. And I'm just telling you today, if you want to be at that banquet with me, no longer live for yourself, but live for he who died for you, Jesus Christ. And he rose again that you may have eternal life. Now, some of you are thinking of someone else right now, and I'm telling you, I'm talking to you. Oh, I wish Johnny would hear this sermon. No, 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 no. I'm talking to you because they need to see the gospel in you today. They need to see that you are at peace with Jesus today. It always concerns me when Christians begin to say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Shut up, chicken little. The sky is not falling. Jesus is coming soon. And lawlessness in our world is going to increase. It says that. Does that mean that we do nothing about it? Of course not. We do something about it. We pray, we intercede, we vote, we do all those things that we can do about it. But the fact is, is that Jesus Christ is coming back soon, and as, as, as lawlessness increases, love is going to decrease. And it's not going to be from living for ourselves that's going to change our world or our culture. It's going to be living for the one who died and rose again. Now look at 16. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not going to like this verse. I'm telling you, you're not going to like it because if you choose to apply it, some of you have to change your stinking thinking. This is why some people say, how do you keep your marriage vibrant? It's from this next verse. Therefore, from now on, wait, wait, I don't think I should reveal it to you. Because I mean, if you, if you actually read it and you actually believe it, it's going to be a problem. Because you can't, you can't do relationships the same if you actually hold on to this. Look at this. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Homie, say what? We recognize no one according to the flesh. But you don't know how long I've been married. And she did blah, 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 blah. And yada, 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 yada. This says we do not recognize people according to the flesh any longer. But, 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 I don't care about your butts. What I'm saying to you is you don't regard people according to their fallenness any longer. That's what he's saying. He said, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we've seen Jesus according to the flesh, yet now on we know him no longer in this way. He's saying, guess what? He said, because of his death and resurrection, we no longer look at someone else's fallenness. We look at the redemptive work that Jesus is doing inside of them. 
You want to change your marriage? Start seeing what God is doing instead of, instead of seeing what God perceivably is not doing. Start seeing how God is transforming instead of that other person's fallenness. See, we proclaim people's fallenness much louder than we proclaim their redemption. From now on, no one likes to be regarded as according to the flesh. No one. Do you remember when you were in junior high or high school and you, or you did something stupid? There's a bunch of liars in the room here today. I don't know what he's talking about. I would believe that about everyone except for Pastor Norm, but <laughs> he's the most innocent guy I know. But Debbie did talk to me once, so I know a little bit. Uh, but I'm just, pl- I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. But what I'm saying to you is I know that some things you just can't, outlive right you know like when i was raised in a small town there's certain things that you did and people just remember it so you have one or two options you move to spokane that's what i did or you begin to embrace the newness of jesus christ about that other person see the problem with family is is that your family You know everything about them. You know everything about all their fallenness. And yet, sometimes you want to proclaim their fallenness louder than their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And how we do it, it sounds very spiritual, by the way. We're like, I'm just looking at their fruit. You're like, what? I I mean, I think we should have good fruit, don't get me wrong. But what I am saying to you is, I'm sure glad that God doesn't just come up and expect a moment of my time and say, well, bad fruit, bad day, Ah, he's out of here. I'm glad that that God looks through the blood of Jesus Christ and he proclaims my redemption every single day, every single morning, louder than my fallenness. And church, you may have had someone that's hurt you, a family member that has has done you harm or injustice. And let me tell you, God is at work in their life and in their hearts. If you could simply hold on to the fact that God is at work, he's not an absent God who's far away, but he's a near God who's at work. You say, you don't know my uncle. Again, I will say it loud and clear, I don't care who your uncle is, I care who your Jesus is. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is thick enough for anyone's fallenness in this world. But they haven't repented. I understand that repentance is key. But are you going to get them to a place of hope by saying what's wrong with them? Or by saying what God can do in them? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith does not come by hearing and hearing about how messed up I am. I say this to parents all the time when they're talking about their young men and women. They'll say, they just won't do this, they won't do that. They tell me all these things. I say, have you already told them? Yeah, I've told them. So now you're just repeating yourself. Yeah, I'm repeating myself. Now who's the stupid one? This is why people don't come back very often for biblical counseling from me. They say, what? I don't usually say stupid. I say something, I say, well, who's the idiotic? No, I don't say that either. What do I normally say? I say something like, oh, that's what I usually do, but I'm thinking the other thoughts. (laughs) But what I'm saying to you is, what if you brought hope into the picture? I can remember being in Little League in in baseball. Where, Where is it where they put the kid that can't do anything in baseball? It's... See, everyone knows that. I always forget that. It's right filled, right? And you got to remember, I've had cataract surgery with contact lens implants. So these are thin glasses, but I used to have glasses about this thick, right? Negative 14 and negative 13, 2800 vision, right? And if I looked up at the sun, my eyeballs would just burn out like sausages, right? So I was sitting out in right field, and they started yelling. Yeah, I w- yeah that's true. I was sitting. I was looking at the little... I was looking at the little, uh, you know, those little dandelions. Yeah, dandelions. I was picking. And all of a sudden I hear, Brian, the ball. 
no one ever hits it to right field. So I was just like, Brian, the ball. So I get up, and I got my glasses on, and I'm like, I'm going to get it. The ball lands right, right there. I'm like, oh. I can remember in Little League that the baseball coach dude, he would be like, okay, Brian, now when you get up there, he would say, keep, keep your eye on the ball. That's just stupid. Keep my eyeball on the ball. Like, how do you do that? You, like, remove the eyeball and put it on the ball? Like, what does that mean? And my hope was that they would hit me with the ball so I could finally get to base. They can keep your eye on the ball, and I would just be up there. I don't even see the ball. So that was my baseball. But some of us, when we're talking about someone else's fallenness, this, we coach like this. We coach our little league people like this. We say, hey, guess what? You're going to strike out. When you get up there, you're going to miss that ball. This is how we coach our Christianity. Hey, when you get up there, guess what? You are not going to hit the ball whatsoever. You are not going to get on base. You're not going to win. You're a loser. That's how we do Christianity sometimes. And yet when we add Jesus to it, I think our coaching should look more like this. Keep your eye on the ball. You're going to knock that thing out of the ballpark because Jesus is inside of you. You are going to be changed and transformed. You are going to be a new person. Guess what? You're going to hit a home run, Brian. It's not because of you. It's because of Jesus. See, what I'm saying to you, if we start coaching through not people's fallenness, but we start coaching through the resurrection, then hope would come into the picture. Because it would be based on my little, little league abilities. It would be based upon the ability of God. And so many of us, in our relationships with our kids and with those, our grandkids around us, so many of us are proclaiming their fallenness instead of the hope through Jesus Christ. They don't need to know any more about what they're fallen than they need to know about the, this, like, little league, you're a loser. They need to hear, repent, and guess what? You're going to make it. Guess what? You are a brand new creation. Guess what? You're going to make a home run. Why? Not because of what you do, because of what Jesus is doing inside of you. Do you see what I'm saying? And this is what he says. We regard no one according to the flesh any longer. In other words, I translate this in my head. We regard no one with pop bottle glasses who can't swing at the ball any longer. I go, praise Jesus, because I'm a band geek. That's good. Yet now we know him, Jesus, in this way no longer. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or creature. Think about that for a moment. See, I just said you're looking dead, but now the person next to you say, because of Jesus, go ahead. Come on, play the game with me. Come on. Because of Jesus, you're brand new. Now, if it's your wife, you can say, hey, baby, you're looking brand new today. And I ain't talking about your makeup. I'm talking about your spirit. See, this, some of you guys don't have a very romantic life, I can tell. But there's some of you, I can tell, you're like, oh, I got that one. Save that one. Put that in my pocket and save it for a ride home. But what am I saying to you? Therefore, if anyone, <laughs> if anyone is in Christ... He is brand new. This is how you're to regard them, not according to their fallenness any longer, but according to their newness. But we're so worried that people may not repent that we keep going back. You need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. Yes, call them repentance and then tell them they are brand new in Jesus. Tell them that they need to repent, but then tell them, guess what? You are brand new. You're going to make it. You're going to do it. Not because of your own strength, not because of your own power, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling with inside of you. You're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Don't you just love that? When it talks about this this newness of life, that we're controlled by love, that that we don't live for ourselves any longer. We're no longer counting those things of the flesh. We're no longer looking at those things. Why? Because we're brand new in Jesus. I do reconciliations all over the world, and this is the thing. If, if we reconciled in the way that our, uh, the, the way that we, if, if our gospel was dependent upon how we reconciled, we'd be in deep trouble. What I'm saying to you is our reconciliation needs to be based upon the gospel. 
Some of us are waiting for someone else to repent, to reconcile to them. Some of us are waiting for, for someone to do the right thing before I reconcile with them. Can I tell you, that is not the gospel message. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. Could you imagine if he waited? Well, I'm just going to sit on this rock until people start repenting, and then I'll go on the cross. I don't know why that was a John, that sound more country, didn't it? I don't know if Jesus sounded like that. But what I'm saying to you is, what if he just waited? He said, well, I'm just going to sit here, and I'm not going to go over there. Some of us, we've had people who've passed away before us, and we're not reconciled. And you're like, well, what? Can I tell you? Jesus' reconciliation is not based on anyone else. Nothing else. Because why? Reconciliation is a heart attitude that leads into physical actions where you lay down the offense at the cross. And you say, God, I entrust it to you. I die to this. And you no longer regard people as their old way of life. Why? Because they're brand new. Now, all these things, verse 18, are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, there's a lot, of, a lot to this verse. And I want you to grab a hold of it. It says, now, all these things are from God who reconciled. You guys remember back in the old days when we used to have checks? Some of you, this is like, yeah, we still use a checkbook. Okay, well, you guys hear what I'm saying. Okay, you got it. You're on with me. So I remember as a young man, you had these checks, and you would write a check, and then you would go up to the little ledger, and you'd write Safeway, and a bag of groceries, like 10 bucks, right? You know, like 10, 20 bucks. And you'd write that up there, and then you would, you like, you'd take the balance from up here, and you would subtract the check, and you'd write a new balance. You, you guys remember that? Yeah. Some of you are like, he doesn't do that anymore. Don't judge me. I'm brand new. All right, so we used to do that. And then in the, in the mail, you would get a bank statement. And you would look at the bank statement, and you would reconcile, right? You would say, okay, there's my check for Safeway. Oh, yeah, it matches. And you'd check it off. And you would, you'd make sure what the bank statement had to say matches your handwritten ledger that you could never read said. You guys know what I'm talking about? And then if there was an error, you'd go back to the bank, and they would tell you, you're wrong. <laughs> and then you would try to figure it out. You would reconcile your ledger to what the bank statement was. The reason why I say this is because as I speak to young people, they're like, I, I don't do that. I just push a button, and it all, you know. What this is saying to us, then, is that you have a bank statement, which is your life, and you have Jesus' bank statement that he reconciled himself through Christ. He used Christ as the reconciliation. He reconciled us through Christ. He says, I look at your bank statement, and it ain't worth a lot. In fact, it's negative. I look at my son Jesus' bank statement, and it's worth a ton because he was sinless. So I take your bank statement, and I don't bring Jesus' account down to you. I bring your account up to equal what Jesus' account equals. I balance it out so it's reconciled. Now, you think about this for a moment, about the value that God's placed in your heart and in your mind, that he has placed in you. He has given you the value of Jesus Christ in your bank account. Now, before you pull out Visa and try to spend it, I'm not sure they're going to allow that currency to go through. But when you look at what I'm saying to you today is that he's given you, he's reconciled you through his son Jesus. So the value of Jesus is your value. And the question I have is, why do we have 45% of all Americans struggling with depression? I know that it can't be biological, so I'm not talking about that group of people. But I am going to talk to you for a moment about this idea that maybe we don't see the value of Jesus so we don't understand the value of ourselves. Church, this, this Christmas season when you're talking about reconciliation, it's not about you bringing your bank account up. That will be depressing. 
It's about God bringing it up for you and saying, guess what? The value of you equals the value of Jesus. You are my kid. Think about that for a moment. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, for all the legalistic, they're saying, well, this is about our relationship with God, that, that we're supposed to reconcile people to God. Yes, we are. This reconciliation this way. But do you think in your theology that God wants you so reconciled this way and ha- living like it's hell on earth this way? No way, Jose. He wants you reconciled this way and this way. And the only way that this way and this way happens is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the only way that you can be reconciled. And guess what? It's not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon Jesus Christ. He is reconciling you. He has brought your accounts to be equal. Why? Because you are brand new in Jesus. You have been set free because of Jesus. Now, it kind of goes downhill from here a little bit. Because he says, namely... That God was in Christ (laughs) reconciling the world to himself. Look look at this. He says namely, which is like the idea of of most importance of, you know, focus on this for a second. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Then it says this statement. That God reconciled the world to himself by not counting their trespasses against them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you know that God doesn't count any longer? The scoreboards in God's kingdom are torn down because of Jesus. He's not counting any longer. He's not keeping score any longer. Yet sometimes in our families, in our relationships, we're still keeping score. He says, I don't count their trespasses against them any longer. I went to state A basketball championship four times in my high school. We took, our team won every time. Now, before you get too excited, I was in the band and the players were on the court. I was playing my trombone. Directed the music and making sure that team won. And I guarantee they wouldn't have won if I wouldn't have been there. (laughs) But what I'm saying to you is this. In basketball, in baseball, they have a scoreboard and they keep score. Church, what if our homes tore down their scoreboards and said no longer keeping score? It's all been reconciled because of Jesus. I'm no longer keeping track. It's all been reconciled because of Jesus. I'm no longer trying to say it's this for that or whatever it might be. That we stop counting. Do you know that no one can control your attitude except for you? I have people tell me all the time, well, I'm just not sure I feel like I can forgive yet. I say, what? What? What does that mean? I, I, I'm just not sure, I, you know, I, if I can trust them because, because they've done this, this, and this, and this. Okay. I understand trust. Maybe you don't want to be their best friend, but can you entrust the judgment over to God and let him be the judge and you stop playing God? See, we have a bad idea. But some of us don't believe that God will actually hold people account, to account. So we try to take that judgment seat to try to do it for him. We get this cheap theology, uh, uh, it's talked about in Jude, about it's like licentiousness, where we just say it's so cheap that, that God's just going to wink at all sin. When you stand before a righteous God on judgment day, and you're in willful disobedience to God, and you have willfully harmed others, I guarantee this, you will be shaking in your boots. God is a just God. You say, but you just said he doesn't count. Yes, he doesn't count for those who live a repentive life, who have turned their life over to Jesus, who have said, I am working towards walking with you. He doesn't count for those. But if you're in willful disobedience to God, you say, I I can make up my own rules. You, You better watch out. 
that God, through Jesus Christ, reconciled the world, not counting their trespasses. I believe that there's some here today that need to stop counting about their spouse. You say, I, Brian, you don't know who I live with. I'm sorry, you chose that person. I didn't choose them. See, that's rude. You think about it. How many of you, when you signed up for marriage, you're like, oh, I, I fully understand that we, no, you got into marriage, you're like, oh my, what did I get myself into? And the blood of Jesus started coming down and you started forgiving. But you've been carrying some bitterness for a long time and God said, just lay it down. I've laid it down for you. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You know what that means? That means that God's saying, here, I, I, I'm going to make it so that your bank account comes up. And some of us are over here saying, God, don't touch my bank account. I'd rather be negative. He says, I urge you, I implore you, be reconciled. Let God fix it through Jesus Christ. No, I, I'd rather fix it on my own. I don't know if I can trust him to do a good job. Yes, you can trust him. He's a good God. He cares for you. Let him take that sin. Let him take that thing, that, has, that injustice that was done for you, and say, God, I let you reconcile this. I'm no longer going to carry it any longer. I'm going to let you make the payment on that. He made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin. On our behalf. Did you hear that? And your greatest point of injustice is your greatest opportunity for Christ's likeness. I say that often because you need to get a hold of it. I'm a Christ follower, except for when it comes to an injustice in my life. I don't like those. Guess what? He made Jesus, I'm adding that word for him. He made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on my behalf. On, behind, on your behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Turn to the person and say, you're no longer looking dead. Go ahead. You're looking brand new, and you're looking righteous. And your righteous is not based upon you. It's based upon Jesus Christ. It's not your self-righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. You say, I don't, I don't know if I can be righteous. I'm going to make a mistake. That's like the baseball player. You're going to strike out. We make excuses for sin all the time. I want you to know you can live a holy life set apart for God. You can walk in newness of life. That you don't have to go each day barely making it. You can make, live a gospel day where you begin to walk in that hope that only comes from Jesus Christ. Where you are controlled by his love. Where you're not keeping count any longer. That you're looking at others according to the new creation of Christ in them. You no longer have to walk according to the flesh. But you can now walk according to the spirit. You got this because Jesus has got you. It's not based upon you. It's based upon who God is. He's not counting any longer. He has called you and set you apart by the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He has made you brand new. What if this season... We no longer defined ourselves by our fallenness or our family members by their fallenness. But we began to pray and say, Lord, let me see what you're doing in their heart and their minds. What's that rapper dude that just came to know Jesus? I always say his name wrong. Yeah, I always want to say Conway, but it's Con A. Whatever, you guys know what I'm talking about. Obviously, I don't listen to that, that, whatever. But what I'm saying to you is, let's take that person and define them according to the Spirit. Do you realize that the old, I mean, in the New Testament, when Paul went from Silas to Paul, people wanted to keep defining him according to his flesh? What, what if we did that today? We would like, 
I don't want to tear my Bible. We would tear off a lot of this, these books. And some of us are tearing parts of the gospel out just because we want to hold on to something. Church, it's time we lay it down. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And we're going to have a response time. And the response time looks like this. And it's going to be very, we're going to go through each of those points. And this is between you and the Lord. The first one is this. You would say, you know what? This season, help me to be controlled by the love of Christ. And you'd say, that's me. I need to be controlled by Christ's love this season. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to go through each one of those things I just went through, main points, and ask you to say, that's, that's what I want to work on. And as, as we stand across the audience, then I'm going to pray for us at the end. So with every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. Lord, you know who we need to be reconciled to. For some of us, we need to be reconciled to you. For others of us, we need to be reconciled to the world around us, our brothers, our sisters, our fellow human beings. Lord, would you convict us of our sin this morning? Bring to mind those relationships that are filled with fear, bitterness, rage, resentment so that we can lay that down at the cross today. So if you're here and you, as I prayed, you're like, man, I need, I need love, Christ's love to control me in this, with this person. I want you to, to stand to your feet. If that's you this morning. Maybe you're here and you say, I, I need to no longer live for myself in this relationship. I've been living for myself. And you're just, right before the Lord, you're saying, Lord, I, I, I'm living for myself in this, and I need, I need to die to myself. Stand to your feet for that one. Maybe you're here and you say, I've been recognizing this other person according to their flesh, and I, I just need to stop doing that and start seeing what God's doing in their life. Maybe that's you, and you can stand on that one and say, Lord, that's me. And you're just going to lift that person up to the Lord and lay them at the altar. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Lord, would you help me to embrace the new in that other person? The new thing that you're doing, the way that you're calling them to repentance. You want to stand on that one. Maybe you're here and you say, I got to start seeing their bank account the way that God sees their bank account. That they're reconciled through Jesus. You want to stand on that one. Maybe you're here and you would say, I've been counting, and I need to stop counting. Say, that's me. I've been counting. I, I go to these family events, and I'm just waiting for them to make a mistake. And I, I put another tick mark down and say, see, that's who they are. And you need to stop counting today. I want you to stand. Maybe you're here, and you would say, I need to live a gospel-centered life where I see people through the gospel. To, and I, I'm begging them to be reconciled to God. You want to stand on that one. And finally, maybe you're hearing it say, Lord, would you make me righteous through Jesus Christ? you change and transform me? You can stand on that one. So Lord, I, I just pray over all those who are standing. Let's lift our hands to the Lord and say, Lord, we just give you these relationships. Lord, I just pray for all those who are standing and I'm standing on myself. Lord, I just give this relationship that I'm thinking of over to you, God. God, would you help me not to count? Would you help us not to count, God? Would you help us to be controlled by your patience, your kindness, your hope, God, your love? God, would you help us to see people through the blood of Jesus Christ that you have reconciled their bank account, God? And we would no longer define them 
according to their flesh, but will we define them according to what you're doing in the Holy Spirit, God? God, there's relationships in my life where it's so much easier to think on or to dwell on someone else has followed us, Lord. Let me die to myself, God, my arrogance and my pride, God. Lord, I ask that you would help me not to live for myself any longer, but to live as Christ lived, God. Give me gospel lenses to see those perspectives through the gospel, God. God, would you help me to be your ambassador, God, that you would help me to beg people to come to be reconciled with you, God. Lord, we just need a miracle in the Spokane Valley and surrounding areas, God. God, we need a miracle around the United States. Lord, will you use us as vessels of reconciliation this season, God? God, that we would simply step out and be bold. And Lord, that you would use us to speak the truth and love to others, God. And Lord, that we would focus less on calling people out and we would focus more on calling people up. God, that our hope and our desire would not be to call people out, God, but we would call them up and say, guess what? The cross is big enough. Guess what? Jesus died and he rose again. The gospel is good enough. God, guess what? You are brand new. I don't care what your flesh is saying about you, but you are brand new. That we could call people up, God. Would you empower us with your Holy Spirit and use us mightily? In Jesus Christ's name I pray.